Out of the message, the unveiling. Uh, let's go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we love you and honor you and worship you. God, we thank you that uh, for your anointing to preach the gospel. Father, we thank you for the anointing of Elijah, the anointing of John the Baptist, God, that continues to reign in these last days. Father, let your word come forth. Father, you said blessed is the one that reads and blessed are the ones that hear the revelation of Jesus Christ. Father, let your word come forward with power. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's talk about the context of this to start with. And, but before you talk about the context, you've got to talk about the person that actually has written uh, the book of Revelation. Now, in his gospel, St. John, he referred to himself as the one that Jesus loved. If anybody ever really pay, slow down and pay attention to that? He referred to himself as the one that Jesus loved. We see in John 13, 23 through 25, and stay in Revelations 1, and you can make a note of that or go back and look at it later. We can clearly see the intimacy shared between Jesus and John. This level of intimacy wasn't prompted by Jesus. See, Jesus is not a respect of person. And He will grow in intimacy with anyone that puts the effort forth. But John had found a special place in Jesus' heart. He was also a part of the three disciples that Jesus was closest to. We see John which is, and James, his brother, and Peter. Many a times you would see them Jesus pulling himself off with just those three disciples. There's a lesson in that too that sometimes, you know, it says that a, in Proverbs, a man with many friends comes to ruins, right? You ever find somebody that nobody can talk bad about or find somebody that everyone's got something good to say about? That means that that fellow is a man pleaser and not a God pleaser. The gospel of Jesus Christ is non-politically correct and it is straight up offensive. When you look at somebody and say your beliefs are going to send you to hell and the only way to go to heaven is to believe like I believe. Is that not offensive? That's offensive. So I read in John 13, 23-25 and I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Version. One of His disciples whom Jesus loved so John's writing that, but we have to understand that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it says one of His disciples whom Jesus loved and uh, or esteemed was leaning against Jesus' chest. So Simon Peter motioned him, John, he motioned him quietly and asked him to ask Jesus a question. Of whom was he speaking? Then leaning back against Jesus' chest, he, John, asked him privately, Lord, who is it? So we see a picture here. This is at the Lord's Supper. This is the, the last days. This is the last time that Jesus will break bread with his disciples. Here in a little bit, Jesus is going to be arrested. Jesus had told them plainly that one of these twelve are going to betray me. Anybody got any younger brothers or sisters, right? Don't you always send them to mama and daddy to ask the hard question? <laughs> so that, that's the same thing we had here. See, John and Jesus were about the same age. We'll see when G uh, John began to write Revelation, he was about 95 years old. And that was about, it was 95 A.D. So John, being the youngest disciple, was prompted by Peter to go ask Jesus the question. Why do I say all that? Because I want you to see that what had to take place, the intimacy that was required for Jesus to reveal Himself in the book of Revelation. The Bible doesn't say why Jesus chose Peter, James, and John as an inner circle. However, these three men were present at a lot of Jesus' special events. 
being an eyewitness to Jesus' transfiguration, witnessing Jesus raise Jairus' daughters from the dead and accompanying him while he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. These three witnessed Jesus' greatest times of glory and his darkest trials. They were his closest friends. The intimacy between John and Jesus was required for John to receive the revelation of what would transpire in the last days. This revelation wasn't a mere dream or a fleeting vision. It was a life-altering encounter with the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus, the only Christ. The lesson here is for us to understand that the Lord is always talking. He is always talking with a Elijah what happened. He, he got depressed. Why did Elijah get depressed? Because he had been under such a great anointing of God. Let me tell you what happens after I pray for a lot of people. Especially if we encounter demonic spirits. When that a hand of God comes off me, lifts off of me, I fall into a temporary depression. I get drained. Everything is gone. It took Marilyn a while to understand that after I get through preaching or praying for people, I just needed some time alone. I didn't have anything else to offer. But just like Elijah, in our darkest times, God is speaking. He said that the, it came by a great wind, wind that was so strong that it busted the rocks. A great thunder and fire, but God was not speaking in any of those things. God was speaking in a still, small voice. God is speaking in a still, small voice. In our morning uh, Sunday school class, we're talking about a quiet time with the Lord. Taking time and setting them aside as men so we can hear from God. Let me tell you, there is a constant attention for your thoughts. The devil's always trying to get into your head and God is always speaking to you. But what is required to hear from God is closeness. It's intimacy. Sometimes God will yell. Sometimes God will holler. Sometimes God will shake you because He loves you. But most of the time, He's just in the background saying, come to me. Open your Bible." Why don't you pray about that? If you'll respond right, everything will be okay. I love you. I promise you that this is going to turn out for your good. But when we begin to say the opposite to that, we crowd out the voice of God. And we open ourselves up to be further controlled by darkness because the power of life and death is in the tongue. Now James and his brother, uh, John and his brother James started their ministry under Jesus' first cousin, John the Baptist. Like most other disciples, he was a fisherman and he was a little rough around the edges. I know some of you construction workers, you talk about how vulgar the language can get at times. I know it's the same thing in the car lots. It amazes me at how far people can go with the depravity of what they're willing to say. It tells us in Ephesians that the things done in the dark don't even need to be mentioned. We should turn our back when men begin to talk like that, but... Jesus was, and I'm not talking about being so self-righteous that every time somebody says a little swear word that you rebuke them. I'm talking about the things that are depraved that they should not even be saying. If you've heard me preach a few times, I, you have used in rehabs and different places in jail. I've used swear words to get people's attention. If the men have heard me say it several times, about not being Satan's punk, but I wouldn't say it now, but to, to, to drive the point home to a group of prisoners, I would actually use the other word. Now John is responsible for writing a large part of the New Testament. You have uh, the one that wrote most of the New Testament was the Apostle Paul. And then John behind him, he wrote... The Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the mysterious book of Revelations. The Gospel of John is the only Gospel that doesn't use any parables. Did y'all know that? 
There are no parables in the Gospel of John. When somebody's starting their Bible reading, I suggest that they start with St. John. Why? Because it expresses the deity of Christ that God sent His Son, that God was born here in the flesh. See, because if I can discount that, if I can say Jesus is just a good man, I destroy everything about the gospel. If I can say Jesus didn't really die, that he really didn't rise on the third day, then it's not the gospel at all. So the central theme of his gospel is the deity of Christ and the love of God. Also, we see a glimpse of what the Holy Spirit is all about and why the Holy Spirit comes in his dispensation of time. Now John had been exiled to the island of Patmos here. He was 95 years old. He would not, Rome said, you're going to have to stop preaching. There's coming a time and it's already happening in other so-called free countries where it's illegal to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we've got to prepare ourselves. And I'm talking about getting into an intimate relationship with God where we can stand up and say, you can kill me but I will not stop proclaiming the law of an almighty God and His justice. But a lot of people are going to be deceived when they offer that $20,000 stimulus check to go get a little mark. The devil's got plenty of money. He might offer you $100,000. And then you're going to start justifying it. You're not going to know what Revelation says because you skipped Sunday school. So $100,000, just go down and get this little tattoo. We just need to keep up with you. All your banking records will be on there. We, we need to know if you're vaccinated or not. This is the reason the book of Revelation is so important, especially at this time. But John would not shut up. They bullied him in all. Could you imagine being dropped and bullying all? But he would not shut up. See, he had an encounter like Jeremiah did. He said, I was weary with forbearing. I said that I would not make mention of his name. But his word was like a burning fire shut up in my bones and I could not stay. See, John remembered laying his head on Jesus' chest. John remembered when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. John remembered when on the third day when they went to that tomb that it was empty and the grave clothes were folded nicely and laid at the head. He knew that G and that he was there when Jesus revealed himself after he was resurrected. And at the day of Pentecost, before the day of Pentecost, he seen Jesus ascend unto heaven. So it's experiences like that that keep a man. They asked me yesterday, and Sister Donna Howard said, it talk to me about how you know you're called to preach. I said, well, I'll, I remember it like it was yesterday. I don't remember the pastor, but Adamsville Church of God of Prophecy, I was 10 years old, and, and they had an altar call. I don't even think I was listening to the message. I was like old Jonathan over there one day when he just starts crying. He don't even know what's going on. Why are you crying? I don't know. I just knew I had to get to the altar. I got to the altar. Next thing I know, it was like a bolt of lightning hit me. I'm laid out on my back. I begin to stammer in lips. I begin to speak in tongues at 10 years old, not knowing what was going on. And I heard it, but I still hear the voice today. That God said one word. He said, preacher. And I, I had, to, had to go down a long ways before I realized that that's what I was called to do. He had an unshakable experience with God. A lot of times when I'll pray for God to break you, I will pray for God to crush you, I'll pray for God to put you in jail, but also what I pray for is when you're struggling is for God to reveal Himself to you, for you to have an encounter with Him that no matter what happens, that you never lose sight of that experience you have with God. See, John had that kind 
of experience. Jesus chose John to reveal the events that would unfold in the last days. Much of the imagery in the book of Revelation is symbolic and would have naturally been impossible without the advancement of technology. A hundred years ago, the thought of an image speaking to everyone over the entire earth at the same time is impossible. It was impossible a hundred years ago. 50 years ago, 80 years ago, impossible. But today, we can see it happen all the time. We can all tune in to the same live broadcast and watch everything at the same time. We have had people in, in Africa, in Pakistan, watch our live services. So I'm preaching over here, and they're watching on the other side of the world. The fire falling from heaven, we understand that that fire falling from heaven is a nuclear weapon. It's a bomb. See, but when John was writing all this, he was just trying to describe it the best way that he knew how. <clears throat> the idea of a microchip or a tattoo, the mark of the beast didn't make any sense until here, 50 years ago, when we began to see that the technology was <clears throat> advancing so fast. We went, you know, just think about it. Uh, 80 years ago, every phone had a wire to it, right? Every phone had a wire to it. Now, we got phones. It's like they want me to rate the FaceTime thing. I'm, I'm like, I remember one phone in one house that had a cord, and I can actually see them. How can I not rate it but a five? The advancement in technology. <laughs> Daniel 12 and 4 says, But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal it up in the book until the end of time. Now listen, many will rush here and there or run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. I looked at how fast knowledge is increasing. I think it is every year knowledge is doubling. Eventually, it's going to be every six months, every three months. Within the next 20 years, knowledge will be doubling every 12 hours. What does that mean? Well, that means that they actually have a uh, biological chip, a flesh-type chip that they can implant in your body that will communicate with you and other people, letting you know when you get exposed to the COVID virus. This isn't science fiction. They have it. They're going to try it out with the soldiers to start with. Why are they going to try it out with the soldiers? Because soldiers are just like trucks. They're property. So in John's Gospels and letters, we see the great love. While we also see the thunder of God's justice burst from the pages of Revelation. James and John, one day they were went into a city and they rejected Jesus. How many people know that Jesus and God is limited to interfere with your life based on your permission and based on your faith? Now, I'm not telling you if you believe hard enough, you're going to be able to do anything that you want to do. What I'm telling you is God wants to interfere and fix your life, but you don't allow Him. He will not force Himself on you. So here they are. They're in this town and, and, and Jesus is trying to preach and they rejected him. James and John said, Lord, let us call fire down from heaven and destroy this city. After that, James and John got the nicknames Brothers of Thunder. So we have three dispensations of time. You got between Genesis and the baptism of Jesus. Not the birth of Jesus. See, Jesus' ministry did not start until the Holy Spirit descended on him. See, he had 30 years where not much happened. He had the one experience we know about when he was 12. But what happened is when Jesus had an encounter and he was baptized and the Holy Spirit fell on him, something changed in the Son of God and his ministry started. So the first dispensation of time was from Adam all the way to the Jordan River where his first cousin baptized him. The second uh, dispensation of time was uh, the baptism of Jesus to the day of Pentecost. And then the last is what we call the church age. It is the time of the Holy Spirit. See, God, the Father, controlled the first. 
Jesus the Son controlled the second and the Holy Spirit controls the church age today. Revelations 1 through 3 will be covering and addressing issues with the church during this time. There's been a lot of controversy over how to interpret Revelation. There is a preterist view. This approach believes that Revelation dealt only with the church in John's day. They did not believe that it was prophetic. They said it only deals with what was going on then. Revelation doesn't predict anything is what they thought. John simply described the events of his current day, but he put them in a symbolic code so those outside the Christian faith could not understand his criticism of the Roman government. So what they said in this view is the book of Revelation was for them and it was not for now. Then you got the historical view. This approach believes that Revelation is a sweeping, disordered panorama view of all church history. In the historical approach, Revelation predicts the future, but the future of the church age. So that everything from Revelations 4 to 22 will happen during the church age. And that's just not true. Then there's the poetic view. This is where we get these theistic evolution morons. This is where we get people that want to look at the Bible as just being symbolic or an allegory. And allegories do exist in the Bible. When David cried after he committed sin with Bathsheba, it said that his bed literally swam with tears. Did his bed float because he cried so much? No, he was just making a point that he cried. When Jesus talked to fishermen and needed to prove a kingdom point, He used a symbolic allegory talking about fishing. When He talked to farmers, He used words that they understand, sowing and reaping. But there are some allegory, there's some uh, uh, symbolic things in Revelation, but it's not that book. So they say it's just a book talking about good and evil, paganism versus Christianity and the ultimate triumph of Christ in our lives. Is all that true? Yes. But it's not limited to just that. The book is seen as a spiritual allegory to comfort and encourage the church, denying that what John saw was actual prophetic future events. Theistic evolution, what do they say? They say that God was the creator of evolution. That God caused the Big Bang Theory 83 million years ago. That's not how it happened. And it's important that you understand and believe that God created this earth some 6,000 years ago and He created one man and one woman and we got the genealogy between Adam all the way to Jesus to prove that it's right. We did not. You don't take a, a microbe and turn it into a microbiologist. We are not the descendants of monkeys or apes or gorillas. We are the descendants of an almighty God created in His image and His likeness. The difference between me and my dog is I have a soul. When that dog dies, he is dead. But there's something inside of me that is going to live forever. Amen. Because I'm a spirit being created in the image of life. Let's talk about the, the real view. So you got, it just applies back then. It's just an allegory that it only applies to the church age. And you can confirm, you know, everybody knows history repeats itself, right? Mm -hmm. About every 80 years we have a war, a big war. Y'all know that, right? War II, 1940. The Civil War, 1860 and 70. About every 80 years. You know, we're due a big war if history repeats itself. But the futuristic or literal view, this approach believes 
that the beginning with chapter 4, Revelation deals with the end times, the period directly preceding Jesus' return. In the futuristic view, Revelation is a book that mainly describes the end time events. Now we got to understand, we're going to get into this, why the rapture is true. you got a lot of people who say rapture is not in the church, in the Bible. Let me tell you, rapture is clearly quoted in the Bible. And God said that He would not pour out His wrath on His children. I don't serve the kind of God that is going to punish me when I live for Him. I'm not telling you things ain't going to get hard. No, I'm not telling you that because they're going to get worse. But that is not going to be the wrath of God. One day the wrath of God is going to be poured out on every abortion doctor that refuses to repent. It's going to be poured out on every politician that's wanting to change the signs on our bathroom doors. It's going to be poured out, but we are going to be gone. Each one of these has a little bit of truth. It, there is allegories. It did apply back then. We believe the book of Revelation must mean something, right? This is a book that Jesus gave to show His servant something. It isn't a book of meaningless nonsense. It has a promise of blessing, not a promise of confusion. There is no blessing in confusion. Secondly, we believe that Revelation definitely claims to contain predictive prophecy. John made it clear things which must shortly take place. The time is near. And you may say, well, he wrote that 2,000 years ago and it hadn't happened. That's the reason you need to get you a study Bible. I've been buying every used life application study Bible I can find and giving them out. But somebody needs to invest in their knowledge of God and instead of buying that pair of shoes you want, you need to spend $35 on your knowledge and get you some good material so you can dissect and understand scriptures. Why is it important to understand these events? Why is it important? I'm not going to be here. Why is it important to know? So I can be prepared because the Antichrist is coming. And he's not coming with horns and a tail. He's coming as the Messiah. He's coming as a false Christ. He is going to be clever. He is going to be tricky. He's going to tell you that poverty is over with. That sickness is over with. That crime is over with. He's going to have practical applications for you to live a utopia here on earth. And for those that are deceived for three and a half years, them folks are going to have it good. But one day in Solomon's temple, they're going to notice that the Antichrist is sacrificing a pig in the temple. And then you're going to have three and a half years of torment and plagues hailstones weighing a hundred pounds. I'm talking rocks on fire, raining from the sky, a hundred pounds. What house is going to withstand that? What bunker? Chaos, anarchy. It's going to be crazy. We think we can somehow stand the... the don't you think about Adam and Eve. So won't you really think about it. They walked with God in the cool of day. They woke up to God. They wasn't. He created them. They was. And they woke up and looked God face to face. And the serpent deceived them. If we are intimately involved with Scripture, we will be easily deceived. So we see an outline of Revelation. Revelation 1.19 says, Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now and the things that will happen. So in verse chapter 1, we see how seen. That's what he saw. Chapters 2 through 3 is the church age, things which are. 
Chapters 4 through 22 are things that will take place after this. So let's now get into the first three verses of Revelation. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ. So Jesus is revealing Himself. Everybody follow that. We all need a good revelation of Jesus, which God gave Him to show His servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to His service, servant John. I want to read that same Scripture out of the Amplified Version. This is the revelation of Jesus, His unveiling of divine mysteries, which God, or the Father, gave Him to show His bond servants, and that is, that's a, a plural there, or those that believe in Him, the things that must soon take place, the things in their entirety, and He sent and communicated it by His angel, the divine messenger to His bond servant John. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The Greek word translated revelation is where we get our word apocalypse. So when we're looking at the word revelation in, in common Greek, they're saying apocalypse. We look at apocalypse, we look at the zombie apocalypse. I like the walking dead. I think it's cool. Daryl is my favorite character. <laughs> Nobody wants to be around a redneck until the zombies show up. The word just simply means a revealing or an unveiling. And this unveiling is the revelation of Jesus Christ in the sense that it belongs to Him. He is the one doing the revealing. It is also Jesus' revelation in the sense that He is the object being revealed. Jesus is the person revealed by the book. From the outset, we are given the most important truth about the book of Revelation. This book shows us the Antichrist. It shows us God's judgment. It shows us the calamity on the earth. It shows us the mystery of Babylon in vivid detail. Most of all, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ to us. If we catch everything else but miss Jesus in the book, we have missed the point of Revelation. So we look, talk about the phrase which God gave him to show his servants. This is an important reason. There's an important reason why God gave the revelation of Jesus Christ. He gave it to show his servants. God gave this revelation that we that it might be shown and not hidden. This is the apocalypse. It's the revelation. It is a, the apocrypha. It's the apocalypse. It is to be revealed. When we look at the word things that must shortly take place. This describes when the events of this book will take place. It says they will happen shortly. They must happen shortly. This means that the book of Revelation is a predictive prophecy. It speaks of things that will happen in the future, at least the future from the time of its writing. Now we look at that and we say shortly take place. That is not talking. If you look at the verb tense, the Greek verb tense of this, it's not talking that it will happen quickly. It is related to Matthew the 24th chapter in birth pains. He's saying when it starts, it's going to move quickly. So when the birth pains start, when the pandemic start, when the blood, when the moon turns to blood, when there's wars and rumors of wars, when there's nation against nation, when there's people group race against race, prepare yourself because it's going to move quickly from this point to the end of the world. Yes. I mean, think about the last year and a half of our life. Think about it. January 2020, everything was going along fine. March, we are shut down. Talking about a, a, a vaccination passports. Like, ran out of change. Couldn't even make money. The world shut down over something that kills a little over 1% of the people affected with it. There might be a lesson in that too. Sis said from the very beginning that this is all about control. He sent and signified by his angel 
to the servant John. This describes how the message is delivered in the book of Revelation. It is the book of signs. The angels signified this message to John. It is the book that communicates in signs. It communicates in symbols. And when we, and you have to think about it, all of a sudden the, the, the most technical thing that you got in the world is a wheel. And you see a missile falling from the sky. How do you describe that? He did the best that he could. And if we will consider technology today and look at the prophecy that technology will be increased in Daniel the 12th chapter, we can see that John was describing what we're seeing happening today. The signs are also necessary because there is a tremendous power in symbolic language. It is the one thing to call someone to some, call someone or something evil or bad. But guess this. In Revelation 17 and 6, it describes this, this uh, new religion. It describes this new world government as a drunk woman, drunk on the blood of the saints. Do you, do you see the difference there? So images reveal... Images speak to us. We're hearing and we see the image in our mind. So yes, the, the book of Revel, Revelation is all about images. Though it is filled with signs, the book of Revelation is accessible to those that have an understanding of the first 65 books of the Bible. And especially an understanding of the first 39 books of the Bible, the Old Testament. The book of Revelation is rooted in the Old Testament. It contains more than 500 allusions to the Old Testament and 278 of the 404 verses of Revelation make Psalm 70% of the verses in Revelation make some reference to the Old Testament by his angel to his servant John. This tells us that who wrote the book of Revelation? It was the servant John, the one that said God, the one that Jesus loved the most. Verse 2, who faithfully reported everything that he saw. This is a report of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amplified says, who testified and gave supporting evidence to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to everything that he saw, everything that he saw in visions. You got, can you imagine seeing all this stuff? We're going to get down here eventually where, where, where uh, I mean, he falls down. He's like, man, I can't handle this. And Jesus is like, hey, John, remember? Remember the Lord's Supper? It's just me, John. It's just me. I got some stuff you need to write down. Start writing. Who bore the witness of the Word of God? In this prologue, we see John knew this book was Holy Scripture, the Word of God. We sometimes wonder if the, the authors of the Bible understood that what they were writing was actually inspired Scripture by the Word of God. I get people and they'll ask me, well, what about the book of Mary? Or what about the, the book of Enoch? Or what about the book of the Gospel of Thomas? Well, let me tell you, God prepared the Bible and put in it exactly what we needed. Amen. Everybody's seen all the UFO stuff, right? Y'all been following this? Following this, we got UFOs following nuclear destroyers. Did y'all know that? And the, the Navy said, we don't know what they are. They operate outside of our understanding of physics. And I'm not talking about some weird website somewhere. I'm talking about Fox News, CNBC. The Navy has come out and said something is following our nuclear destroyers. They can move at angles that we can go from zero to 60 miles in a flash. We don't have nothing that can do that. They said if it is Chinese or Russian technology that we're in a lot of trouble. They said that they hope and pray that it is an alien technology. So how does that apply to the last days? Listen real carefully. The Antichrist is coming back on a spaceship. You may think I'm crazy, but he's coming back. I got about 40,000 handwritten words at the house of dreams 
the Lord. Anybody can come look at it anytime you want to. Of dreams and visions I had about this. I, 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 I didn't, didn't talk about it until the Pentagon said, hey, we got unidentified flying objects in the sky. But if you don't know Scripture, see the first thing he's going to do, he's going to put him in a new Bible, right? He's going, the Antichrist is going to make a new Bible. He's going to make a Bible combining what he calls the Abrahamic faiths. It's going to be a Bible for the Jews and the, and the Muslims and the Christians to all get together in a huddle and hug each other. But that's not the Bible that's going to get you through on Judgment Day. That's the Bible that's going to help you spend eternity in hell. And the first thing that I do, I promise you, is He is going to take out the book of Revelation. He's going to say it does not belong. And He's going to take the book of Enoch, split it into two parts, put part of it in Genesis, and the rest of it in the end of the book. And He's going to say this, real simple. It's because we still got the missing link, right? Y'all science folks know. All of a sudden, we go from eight to... Almost. We, we, never, we never evolved. There's no real evidence for evolution. They say, what about a moth? That ain't evolving. Moths don't evolve. They just turn from caterpillars into butterflies. They, there is no documented real science history showing evolution. So what they're going to say is they're going to say, hey, we visited here 6,000 years ago. We Combine our DNA with the pre-human DNA, DNA to make what humans are today. They will say, "There's a bunch of us. There's a bunch of us gods. And if you will follow us, we're gonna solve all your problems." You know what else they're gonna say? Well, we had to get rid of some folks, them crazy fundamentalist Christians. We, we had to take them out of here. That's why they disappeared. See, it answers so many questions. But if we don't know revelations, we fall victim. We fall victim. That's the reason that it said that we are blessed. Verse 3 says, God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And He blesses all those that listen to the message and obey what it says. Blessed means to be happy, prosperous, to be admired. When things go south, I'm not going to be here and I'm going to be admired. I'm not going to fall victim. Why? Because... I will not be destroyed for a lack of knowledge because I'm going to keep my nose in the Bible. I'm going to keep my head down. And when it comes, I'm going to have a strong enough relationship with the Lord to stand. I'm making sure I don't have anything else I need to say. Y'all got a bunch more notes on here on the thing. Let me get the worship team to come up. We'll start in verse 4 next week. We want to give everybody an opportunity to pray. I know this ain't a shouting sermon, but I promise you it's what the Lord told me to preach. Yeah. And I think it's timely, right? Yeah. Amen. I mean, it's timely. Let's all stand and worship with them. The altars are open, or if you need special prayers, just come forward.